The reading this morning is taken from John, chapter 15, verses 1 to 17. The vine and the branches. I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. Well, every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, so that it would be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me, and I will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If a man remains in me, and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not remain in me, he is like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be given you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourself to be my disciples. And as the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you obey my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have obeyed my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this. He lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants, because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything I learned from my father, I have made known to you. You do not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. Then the Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. This is my command, love each other. This is the word of the Lord. So Father God, we just pray for this word this morning. pray that you would come, Holy Spirit, and be a part of this. And Lord, we pray that my words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. Okay, have you ever noticed how Jesus is very good at using everyday objects to get his message across to people? uses things like lost coins and doors and gates, wide and narrow roads, sheep and goats. And in this story, he uses a vine and a gardener. These images would have been spoken, these would have spoken very clearly to people of Israel at the time, the time of his teaching, because they were everyday objects. For example, bread and wine was the staple diet of working people in Israel. A bit like beer and sandwiches used to be the staple diet for working class people in the UK, perhaps in the 70s. In the Old Testament, the vine is a rich symbol for Israel. God planted, cultivated, and protected his people, and in return, he expected fruit from them. Psalm 80, um, verses 8 onwards, speaks of this. You, God, brought a vine out of Egypt. You drove out the nations and planted it. You cleared the ground for it, and it took root and filled the land. The mountains were covered with its shade. However, as we continue to read through the Old Testament, we see that Israel failed to bear fruit. And again, Jeremiah 2 speaks of this. I have planted you like a choice vine of sound and reliable stock. How then did you turn against me? into a cropped and wild vine. The image of of a vine remains a powerful symbol for Israel even today, 
and it is used as a symbol of Israel in their tourist information industry. Their tourist industry. The symbol is of two men carrying a large cluster of grapes on a long pole. There's a question here. Can anyone remember what part of the Bible that image comes from? Yeah, it's, uh, it's uh, yeah, kind of Joshua's. It's uh, Numbers 13 when, men, when Moses sent 12 spies into the promised land to investigate what it was like. And they brought back a large cluster of grapes and also mixed reports of giants in the land and that it would be too difficult to conquer. What subsequently followed was 40 years of wandering in the wilderness. There is also another amazing image of a vine that is associated with the temple of God. And in the Roman period of Herod the Great, the temple of God was rebuilt. And between the temple's porch and the holy place was a golden gate on which was affixed a golden vine. Clusters of golden grapes hung from it and wealthy families would give golden tendrils and berries and leaves as gifts so that the vine always grew larger. This golden vine grew to be about six feet long and would have been quite a spectacular sight. People passing in and out of the temple would have regularly seen this golden vine. Jesus is probably using this image of the vine because he was moving with the 11 disciples from the upper room to the Garden of Gethsemane, where he was subsequently arrested. They would have walked underneath this golden cluster of grapes. And so he probably used an everyday thing that, again, Israel would have been very familiar with. So that's basically the context of where Jesus is coming from, and perhaps he may have used some of these things as inspiration for his teaching. Okay, the three points I wish to draw out from today's scripture as follows. What is the purpose of being pruned? And what is the significance of our union with Christ? Jesus says, abide with me. And also our unity with each other, with other Christians, determines whether we will live fruitful lives and produce fruit that will last. So we're going to talk about some of those themes in today's talk. So the first point. A vine needs a lot of attention if it's growing to be fruitful. It needs a lot of care and attention from the gardener. And there are two tools that the gardener needs to use if the, if the vine is going to bear fruit, a hoe and a knife. A hoe is used to clear the ground around the vine. If a vine is going to bear fruit successfully, then the soil needs to be cleared of weeds and broken up. The second tool is a sharp knife, which needs to be used regularly. If God the gardener wants to get from us all that he wants from us, his church and children, and he's going to have to use a knife and a hoe all the time. Now, this is quite a disturbing and challenging image and piece of scripture. After all, who wants to be pruned and cut back? It sounds painful, doesn't it? But God uses a surgeon's knife, or secateur's as it were, to keep us healthy and to help us bear even more fruit. The good news is that the gardener is never as close to the vine as when he's using the knife on it. So Jesus, in his teaching, is saying a negative and a positive thing to his disciples and children here. The negative, you will need to be pruned by the gardener. Sometimes we need to be cut back. Sometimes things taken away by the gardener's secateurs. The positive God the gardener is very close to us during this time. And by pruning, or being pruned by the vine dresser, we will be even more productive in the vine. And that is the purpose, to be more productive in the vine. So Jesus is telling us that we cannot... So Jesus is telling us that we cannot be productive unless we are pruned. This is a negative and a positive side of living a fruitful Christian life. So, are we going to allow God to prune us in our own lives and the life of our church? There are two types of pruning that take place in Jesus' teaching in this scripture. 
Some branches produce a lot of leaves, but no fruit. These branches take a lot of energy and goodness from the vine, but give nothing in return, so they are cut away. The second one, which I think is probably more for us, um, is that those branches that produce fruit, but perhaps not very much, and these are signs, there are signs that we are abiding in Christ, but we need to be cut back and pruned regularly if we're going to produce more fruit for Christ. In Palestine, Israel, pruning takes place twice during a season or each year. The first one is in February to March. The vines are cut back so severely that they appear to be mere wooden stumps without life. And then in August, when the vine is filled, when the vine has filled out with leaves, the gardeners cut off the new small shoots so the main fruit-bearing stems would obtain greater nourishment. The vineyard is generally ready for harvest in September. Before this, before this time, the grapes would be too sour for consumption. Now, when I was thinking about this, when the last time we saw the bishop, and I don't want to read too much into this, he said the earliest we'd probably get a vicar, it'd be September. And I just, mm, so we'd have to read into that what we may. Um, a vine needs to be cut right back if it's going to produce a really good fruit. And God is prepared to do this. Isn't that an amazing love? If you really are prepared to cut them down so that they can be really more fruit fruitful, then you must really love them. Do you actually believe that? That God loves us so much that he would dare to cut us back? Personally, perhaps individually, perhaps even as a church. Now, we at Christ Church are going through a season of pruning. Do we think that God really loves us at the moment? Well, what about this for some evidence? Some of, some of you may be aware that Andrew Bowers, who will be speaking to later on, our mission partner in Thailand, towards the latter part of last year, gave us a word of encouragement. And this word of, this word of encouragement, which I think is quite prophetic, was from Hebrews chapter 12, Verses 5 to 13. Uh, and if you've got a Bible, I just, you know, could you, let's, let's, read, let's read this together. Okay, well, I'll read it and perhaps you follow. So it's Hebrews chapter 12, and it's on page 1210. So Hebrews chapter 12, verses 5. To 13. My son, oh, sorry, and my son, do not make a do not make light of the Lord's discipline, and do not lose heart when he rebukes you, because the Lord disciplines those he loves. The Lord disciplines those he loves. And he punishes everyone he accepts as a son. Endure hardship as, sorry, endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as sons. For what son is not disciplined? And everyone undergoes discipline. Sorry, let me just do that again. Endure hardships as as discipline. God is treating you as sons. For what son is not disciplined by his father? If you are not disciplined and everyone undergoes discipline, then you are illegitimate children and not true sons. Moreover, we have all had human fathers who disciplined us and we respected them for it. How much more should we submit to the Father, the Father of our, our spirits, and, and live? Sorry, how much more should we submit to the Father of our spirits and live? Our Father disciplined us for a little while, as they thought best, but God disciplines us for our good, that we may share in his holiness. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. 
Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. Therefore, strengthen your feeble arms and weak knees. Make level paths for your feet, so that the lame may um, may not be disabled, but rather healed. Let's just summarize some of those points. Do not lose heart when he rebukes you. God is treating us like his own children. If we are not disciplined, then we are illegitimate. If we are not being pruned, then we are not his children. In fact, being pruned and disciplined is evidence that we are his children. How about that? No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. However, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. You know, sometimes we want to, and I certainly think of my own circumstances, uh, we want to kind of get through things. And actually, I don't think the Lord wants us to rush through things, because then we won't learn from it. And, some, and it's, you know, it's a really difficult point, this, because it's kind of our whole essence screams against this, and I know mine does. Uh, hardship, pruning, being disciplined. You kind of just want to kind of, let's get it over and done with. Phew, I'm at the other end. But then we've kind of missed the blessing, and there is a blessing. And it doesn't sound right, does it, that there's a blessing in this. But there is a blessing, because we are changed by it. In fact, we become more Christ-like and holy, and we bear more fruit. So let's take courage. God knows what he is doing. He is a skilled and loving gardener. And the real essence is that, the important point is, the vineyard belongs to him. And sometimes I think we forget this. I forget this. The vineyard belongs to him. Christ church belongs to him. The church wherever she is, belongs to him. Are we his children? Okay, so let's be practical. How does God prune us? The first uh, method can be through his word, scripture. How many times have you read the Bible or heard a sermon and the Lord has spoken to your heart and your innermost being? God's word is sharper than a two-edged sword. It cuts deep and it hurts. And God's word finds us out and and we often find ourselves asking questions like, am I really like that? I can remember remember being preached this sermon, or this this scripture, sorry, um, John 15, three times in a row. in in three weeks many years ago when I was at St. Matthew's. It wasn't just there, it was just the number of things I was going to. And I can remember speaking to Malcolm Pritchard at the time, feeling that I was actually quite concerned by this because I knew it was going to be painful. When the Lord says something three times to me, I know he means business. Actually, the vicar said, you should be concerned. I thought, great. (laughs) Okay, what followed was all the things that I was doing, good things. And I, I did you know, missionary work in Africa. I used to work with Soapbox and other ministries that I did at church. They were all pruned back to the stump. And part of that process was coming to Christ Church and leaving my old church. That process of being cut down to size was tough. But I survived and through that process, I have grown. And I, I think I can, I am better off. I tried to do that with gritted teeth, but I, you know, I'm, um, yeah, I think sometimes when you look back on things, the process is not necessarily easy and it is tough. 
But often we need to kind of look back and say, actually, what was that blessing? And the Lord was with me. And I think that bit about the Lord is never as close to us when he's cutting back, I think is absolutely true. It may be that we're having to lean on him during that process. So it's not as much as him coming to us, which he does, but we're having to kind of lean on him, draw closer to him. Now, the vine probably doesn't do that, but I think as human beings, I think we do. The second way he prunes us can be through circumstances. And circumstances are often the result of us not listening to God or can be a means of God helping us to stop doing things, good things, like I mentioned above. Financial services, for example, could be a method of God pruning us at Christ church. The moving of key people from church may, may also be evidence of God working in our church to prune us so that we become more fruitful. And it may be not just us as a church, but it's also for those people as well. Remember, and I want to emphasize this, that the gardener also prunes the branches that are already bearing fruit, fruitful ministries at Christ Church. And we have many ministries that bear fruit at Christ Church. But the Lord may be pruning these back so that they bear even more fruit in the future. We may also have ministries that are not bearing much fruit or no fruit at all, and they need to be pruned. Remember that God is the gardener and the vineyard is his. Now, I don't want to kind of say God is definitely doing this in various people or us. I think we need to kind of pray about that and seek the Lord. But if our eyes are open, things obviously are changing at Christ Church. And why is that? You know, what is the Lord doing? What is Lord, the, the gardener, doing at Christ Church? As I said, I think there's a lot of good here. I think there's some great ministries. But the Lord still prunes them. And he prunes our lives, even the good things that we do, so that we bear more fruit. And we've got to focus on that. The Lord is not doing it because he's mean. He's doing it so we bear more fruit. Second point Jesus is saying is about abiding in me. Jesus is making in this passage is that being pruned, pruned isn't enough. We also need to be accompanied by a close relationship with the vine, with him. The only function of the branch is to connect up the vine and the fruit. The branch's purpose is to transfer the sap from the stock to the fruit. Jesus makes it very clear in this passage that apart from him, we can do nothing. He is talking about spiritual fruit here. You now, you and I can have a reasonably good life, a good career, a good family, with, and all sorts of things, holidays, houses. We can have all sorts of reasonably good things in our life without Jesus. But we cannot do anything for God without him, without abiding in him. The gardener gets nothing from our busy activities unless we are in the vine. That's actually really quite a painful thing to say, and I know I've had that in my life. The gardener gets nothing from our busy activities unless we are in the vine. Why does the gardener have a vineyard? So that it produces fruit. Jesus is saying to us, if you are deeply attached to me and in continuous contact with me, you will bear much fruit. You will be useful to me. It's not how close our relationship with Jesus was 10 to 20 years ago that matters. It is our ongoing relationship with him today. 
if we abide in Jesus, we will live fruitful lives. We will glorify God. Our joy will be complete. We will experience answered prayer. We will see God's promises come true. So what do we mean by fruit? These are spiritual fruits, including love, joy, and peace. And we will also see other people around us respond to our spiritual fruit and be attracted to Christ through him working in us. The vine will also grow new branches, other people becoming children of God, who will also start to bear fruit for Christ. In essence, we will see a a church growth and the kingdom of God expanding. Okay, the final point. Love each other as Christ loves us. Some Christians make the mistake and assumption that as long as my relationship with Christ is sorted, everything in my life will be all right. Jesus is not saying this in his teaching. We can be, we can be abiding in Christ, yet in the wrong relationship with other Christians. Jesus says we are to love one another. At the beginning of this sermon, I quoted Jeremiah 2.21, who spoke about Israel becoming a wild vine. What does a wild vine look like? Basically, the vine is fruitful and is attached to the, the vine stock, but the branches have become all twisted and tangled and caught up with each other. If the vine is going to produce a lot of fruit, all the branches need to be facing the sun properly. And this is why the vine dresser, the gardener, trains the vine so that they are in line with each other. All the branches are open to the sun and not hiding the sun from each other. So Jesus is saying that if we are going to bear fruit, then we need to remain in him and love one another. It is therefore important that we become untangled with one another and enjoy positive relationships with each other. I think over the last few years at Christchurch, we've gotten a bit tangled with each other. And we haven't always enjoyed the experience of positive relationships with each other. In fact, our relationships have sometimes been broken and destructive. However, the good news, there is good news at Christchurch. The week of prayer and fasting we had a few weeks ago was an example of how the church is coming together in putting right and untangling ourselves with one another. That prayer t- and time of repentance and forgiveness was, very, was a very important step for Christ Church in wanting to get right with God and with each other. During that time of prayer, people <clears throat> forgave and released those who had hurt them over the last few years and also asked God to forgive them for the sins and the hurts they had caused others. This was a very significant and important step in the life of Christ Church. It is also an important step in moving forward into our future. Without repentance and forgiveness, we are simply not going to be able to move forward and bear fruit. I want to say that again. Without repentance and forgiveness, we are simply not going to be able to move forward and bear much fruit. So let's keep releasing and forgiving each other of the sins that we cause each other. Let us be more sensitive to each other's needs and be more gracious to each other when we get things wrong. We will get things wrong. We also need to become much more concerned about other branches in the vine, as it were. And this means that we need to have more trusting love with each other, confining one another, share our plans, share and talk together about our hurts, Now, one of the things I have been most impressed with with Christchurch is the quality of home groups and small groups. 
Steve and I as church wardens have been visiting um, the home, a number of home groups and we're going to plan to go and see all of them. I have, I have seen real evidence of how these small groups do really love each other and care for one another. I commend all the small group leaders and members of their home group for their love, care and hard work that they do, that they do week in, week out. Thank you as a church warden and as representative of the church. You know, me and Steve would like to say thank you for your faithfulness to each other and for your witness to our Lord Jesus Christ. And I would encourage people who do not belong to home groups to you know, inquire, speak to Wendy or myself. They are absolutely vital to the life of Christ Church. And they are really important in helping us to, to love one another. So in conclusion, do we want to be fruitful in our own lives and as the bride of Christ here at Christ Church? If we are to be fruitful, then we need to allow God, the gardener, to prune us. Pruning and hoeing is painful, but our Heavenly Father knows what he's doing. Do we trust him? Pruning and discipline is evidence that we belong to, the, belong to Christ. We are not illegitimate children, but children of God. God prunes and disciplines the ones he loves. We need to remain and keep abiding in Christ, the true vine. He is our nourishment. If our own personal lives and our church is not bearing much fruit, then we may, it may be because we're not abiding in him enough through prayer and scripture. Where are we getting our nourishment from? If we're not spending time with him in, in word and prayer. If you want to be fruitful, abide in Christ. Finally, let's continue to practice loving one another. Let's not become tangled and twisted with one another, but love one another as Christ loves us. Father God, we just Father, Father God, we just praise you. And we give you thanks. We thank you that we are not illegitimate children, but children of God. And Lord, as we're in a lot of change at Christ Church, you know that. And you know what it's like. And you, and you know it's painful. And stressful. And it often can give us anxiety. But Father, we, may we know your closeness during this time. May we know your closeness, Father. Father God, we believe and we trust in you that you know what you're doing. We long to be a church that bears fruit for you in our own personal lives, but also as a bride of Christ. We want to be fruitful. We want to glorify you. And Lord, we thank you as when the scripture says that you are patient with us. You are patient. Thank you, Father. Help us also with our relationships with one another, Lord. Help us to love one another as you loved us. So, Father, by your Spirit, may you continue to be at work within us and also as a body, Lord. Pray, come Holy Spirit. Be with us, work within us. Speak to us. And help us to hear you. And then help us to walk 
where you lead. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.